My name is Keith Bystrom, and, and I'm a member of the Humanities Nebraska Board. Originally, I grew up in North Platte, then I taught, I taught law at the University of Oklahoma after being a public defender for a while, and then I was in general counsel's office at Iowa State University, but my wife, who was from Fremont, and I both re decided to retire and come back to Nebraska, which we did in 2018. Um, I want, to want you to welcome, this program is by Warren Brown. Warren, who joins us from Illinois, has spent his life learning about the real Mark Twain so as to educate future generations to learn from his life. Warren has traveled the country interacting with children, companies, and curious individuals to bring Mark Twain to life since 1996. His program, Catch the Twain, promotes appreciation for humanity in a way that is amusing, <coughs> inspirational, and historically accurate. Brown is a member of the Advocates United with more than 20 years of service as a literary literacy tutor and volunteer for various disability groups and was awarded the Studs Turkle Humanities Service Award in 2000. He, he portrayed Mark Twain and served as moderator <coughs> in the Freeland 1862 and the shaping of the modern American Chautauqua. I know you'll enjoy this program. I've enjoyed meeting him over the last two days. Please welcome Warren Brown. I hope that somebody here is checking my math. How many mathematicians do we have in here? Accountants, teachers? None? Wow, this will be interesting. Very interesting indeed. Okay, let's see, three, six, needs six more zeros. And that would be one trillion. I can't count that high. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, you should be taking notes. There is a section in this folder with my name on it that's got blank on one side and you should be writing or checking with your phone the mathematics here because this is critical to everything we're going to talk about for the next 35 minutes. This is six degrees of separation. How many of you have seen the movie with Kevin Bacon? One person, two. How many of you have televisions? Five more. How many of you don't have a television? One person. Okay, good. That's excellent. Do you do a lot of reading? Yes. Or card playing? Sure. Monopoly? All the above. Socializing. Now, that's what television takes away. All right, this would be separation degrees. Degrees. One, two, three, four. Five. I can't write very well on the board. My sister can, she's left-handed, but she writes on the board with her right hand. How many of you can't see the red? There were at least a couple, too. Can you see these? 100? 100? 100? 100? 100? 100? 100? Perfect. So, this represents the 100 would be the number of people that the average person would know that they have in their family, friends, schoolmates, relations, 100. How many of you have at least 100? How many of you have five times that? Yeah. How many of you have less than that because that's always a possibility as well you only have 10 or 12 or 15 people that you're connected with and your neighbors live 100 miles away especially in nebraska when you're in the farm except when you're in big cities so if you were to tell 100 people that you were looking for somebody unique on the planet then just let's pick somebody the janitor that works at the museum in Singapore. We don't 
don't even know his name, but we're looking for him. And we don't have any idea how we're going to go about finding him. We're going to tell our hundred friends who we're looking for, and they're going to now investigate by telling 100 of their friends who will tell 100 of their friends who will tell 100 of their friends, etc., on down. So the way that this works is the first avenue or the first degree of separation, what's the number that we get? 10,000. 10, and the next degree? One million, the next degree? Oh, yeah, and I even gave you a clue here. You don't have to read all the zeros. And the next degree? Ten billion. Ten billion. And the last degree, sixth degree? One trillion people. So, what are the odds that we'd be able to find that person, do you think? Excellent, right? That's exactly correct. And they did two test studies with this, and they used a different example, and they used real people, and they said, we're looking for somebody that lives in Boston. I thought that was a pretty feeble test. You know, let's, let's really give it the scrutiny here. So how many of you know a U.S. president, personally, by name? You've written to them. A couple of people, good. How many of you know a U.S. Senator by name or personally? A couple of them. A couple of them. Excellent. And how about representatives? I don't like their names, but... Uh, yeah, you know, I, I didn't say you had to like them. I've written a lot of letters to a lot of people I didn't like. Usually had something pretty steamy to say. So several of you have written to... These people, how many of you write to the newspaper? How many of you call them on the telephone? Do you write to anybody? Do you ever write letters? Yes. What's your name? Ron. Ron? Ron. Ron, R-O-D. R-O-D. Good. Like a hot rod or the other one? And I write quite a little, yes. Yeah, excellent. So we have a lot of people that we make contact with. So that would be the first degree of my contact with other people. So it's very simple, these exact uh, numbers, and I've got this number here, and I think it's kind of interesting. Today, the current world population, any guesses? This was as of two days ago. Eight billion people alive on planet Earth. That's somewhere between degree four and degree five. So, I thought that was pretty good, but I really am looking for more and better information than that. How many people were ever alive on planet Earth? Oh, at one time? No. Ever? No. Ever alive on planet Earth? How many people would you All guess? Of them. <laughs> <laughs> what was that answer? All of them. All of them. That's right. But they weren't all alive at the same time. But that number is 106 billion people, which is less than 20. only 10 times this number and significantly less than the sixth degree. So six degrees is pretty easy. I think that that's pretty amazing. Now we're going to come back to something else. Do you have that piece of paper? How many of you have two sheets of paper that were given to you as you came in? Or got them ultimately? Everybody, does anybody not have two pieces? One of them says, Marks, remarks, fun-filled facts, true or false, answers provided soon, I promise. How many of you have that? Everybody? Anybody that does not? Hold up your hand. Thank you. And there's another sheet now. And that sheet says further fanciful facts of a few Mark Twain friends. Does everybody have that sheet? A short list of some of Sam's associates. Anyone that does not have that sheet? Two people over here. Everybody else have it? Oh, it's front and back. Is it? 
I tried to get it all onto one page, but I couldn't do it. Yeah, two pages. Everybody should have two pages now. No, you don't need a pen. This is a verbal test. Okay, I want you to pick up. The first thing we're going to do is a Samuel A. Samuel Clemens quiz from Warren Brown, a.k.a. Mark Twain. You see that? It's only got a few. Looks like this. And I'm going to read this, and I want you to raise your hand when you think you know the answer. Which of the following did Mark Twain say was one of the most exquisite books ever written? A. Don Quixote of La Mancha, B. Robinson Crusoe, C. A Tale of Two Cities, D. Jungle Book. A. A. How many of you guessed A? A is the correct answer. All right, the next one. Mark Twain's first published story appeared in Carton Bay in what year? A. 1852. B. 1852. <laughs> C, 1856, D, 1862. Oh, good answer, A and B, but it's not right. The answer is A. I designed this test. A. Not A and B, but that's a real good answer. I like that. Next one. There's something going on here, I think. Yeah. Captain Stormfield's Visit to Heaven was the last book Mark Twain published during his lifetime in 1909. Mark Twain <laughs> began writing this book in what year? What a, 1860. Who said A? That's correct. Did you see this test already? That's the right answer. A. The next thing. This posthumously published novel... Number 44, The Mysterious Stranger, also known as The Print Shop, is the final version that Mark Twain wrote and may be considered his last novel. It was first published in what year? 1969, correct. Great group here. Wow, this is Which of the following is the best, <clears throat> the last novel Mark Twain published in his lifetime? Hey. Personal recollections of Joan of Arc, correct. That would be this book. We talked about that last night. Uh, Mark Twain personally knew many of the presidents of the United States. Who of the following did Sam not meet? A. A. Abraham Lincoln. That's correct. He influenced my life in many ways. He appointed my brother Orion to be Secretary of the Nevada Territory. So, Abraham Lincoln is the correct answer. Which of the following pseudonyms did Mark Twain not use? And the answer is Simon Wheeler, yeah. Not Josh, not W. Rastus, uh, Perkins, or Glad. I used all of those. Ephemenondas, Rastus, Perkins. I used several more, but I mentioned one last night. Does anybody remember what it was? Thomas Jefferson Snodgrass. That's correct. That was one of my favorites. Who of the following did Mark Twain not consider a personal friend? A. Winston Churchill. He knew him. He talked to him several times, but he was not a close friend. And close friends were Helen Keller, Thomas Edison, P.T. Barnum. How many of you know who P.T. Barnum is? How many of you ever met him? <laughs> I saw a statue once. A statue, good, yeah. He had a great circus. Very interesting curiosity shop. And he had a book that he gave to me that he wrote. It was his autobiography. Yeah, he taught me about advertising. He said, many a small thing has been made a large thing with the right type of advertising. Mm -hmm. Which of the following Mark Twain stories was not anonymously published? A, a dog's tale. That's correct. They were all I got a hundred things. You made an incredible observation. <laughs> uh, they were all answered A. At the very top of this page it says, A. Samuel Clemens quiz. <laughs> and that's the correct answer. 
Interesting facts, he crossed the Atlantic Ocean 30 times. He lived in the Nevada Territory for four years before it was a state. In addition to being a friend of U.S. Grant, he publishes personal memoirs of Grant. In 1885, he paid Mrs. Grant $475,000 in royalties. Wow. In 1885, that was a lot of money. Wow. Yeah. Actually, he paid part of it in 85. The other part came a couple months later. That was in 86. So. That fact is in error. Did anybody notice that? Just no. you. Yeah, but that doesn't have an A in front of it, so that's okay. <laughs> He lived at least for several months in Missouri, Iowa, Louisiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Maine, Washington, D.C., and Hawaii. Wow, that's a lot of time, a lot of places. They think the law was after him. I think that's possible. And a few notable friends, Andrew Carnegie, Nikola Tesla, Roger Kipling, Carl Schurz. Peace, happiness, and brotherhood. That's what the world wants. Mark Twain. Okay, let's go to the other page. The true or false answers provided, I promise. <laughs> this one you're going to find a little different than this last test that we took. Uh, if you go down to where it says answers, just above catch the twain, when in doubt, tell the truth. That's from Mark Twain's notebook. And then in parentheses it says, all facts are true. WB. WB, that would be me. Again, guess who wrote the test? <laughs> me. And what do you think is on the opposite side? Well, a little clarification on some of the questions that are on the front. We already know the correct answers for all of these based on this what's in parentheses. They're all true. Let's go through the list real quick. Number one, Samuel Langmark Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain, was born in Florida, November 30th, 1835. Yes, Mark said he was the sixth of seven children, half boys, half girls. True. Mark said he drowned seven times before he learned how to swim. True. Mark believed if children were good, God would, and not only him, but everybody that lived in Hannibal, all the boys, Specifically, God would let them become pirates, not river pilots, pirates. Mark quit school when he was 12, but he earned four honorary university degrees. Mark apprenticed as a printer's devil, a person setting type for the newspaper for six years. Mark trusted every man he ever met on the Mississippi River until he got to know them a little better. Mark wrote Joan of Arc was the most remarkable woman in history. True. He also mentioned people that he put up at that level, his wife Libby, his mother, and Helen Keller. He said she was the most remarkable woman of her sex. Uh, she was a female. What question am I on? Thank you. Mark hoped to be quoted more frequently than Benjamin Franklin. When he was a child, his parents were shoving all his quotes down upon him when he went to school. Every parent of every child was doing the same. He said, if I live long enough, I hope to have more to say than Benjamin Franklin. He liked Benjamin Franklin. He read his autobiography. Somebody said, well, how did Franklin die? And he looked at the end of the book and it says, hmm, it doesn't say. <laughs> uh, Sam did the same thing with this. Okay, what number are we on? Ten. Ten. Mark said he descended from Adam and Eve on his mother's side and Satan on his father. Mark promoted the purchase of Abe Lincoln's birthplace. If you have materials to check out, please do so now. I'll be right there. <laughs> I'll check that out. Do you need my library card, or can I just take it without it? I have a library card. I think it's the most valuable thing I own. How many of you here have library cards? Yeah. 
I tell people at the libraries, when I do a library pro program, I go through their shelves, if you find any book related to Mark Twain that's missing, whatever you paid for that, send me a bill and I'll send you a check. Don't ask any questions, but just do that. Because a lot of times we don't know the value of what those books are worth. If people don't read them, they just give them away in the book sale for hardly anything. That's a great way to shop. I just bought some. <laughs> you did? I bet you have some rare finds. Maybe? I think so, but you absolutely. You're right, doesn't that so? no, no, that's correct. Anyone else have that problem? <laughs> or vice versa? Uh -huh. Okay, so he promoted Abraham Lincoln's birthplace by and for the citizens of America. And the people in government were going to buy Abraham Lincoln's birthplace in Kentucky, and they were going to appropriate the money. And Clemens said, no, that's not right. He's the person of the people and for the people, and we should make that available, that they can participate and donate money. So they came together and they had a program, and they said, uh, you can donate anything more than 25 cents and no more than $25. And they bought that property. Number 12, Mark Twain wrote, he served with Marion's Rangers during the Civil War to stop the Union forces in Missouri. That was Governor K. Claiborne Fox Jackson, and he put together a state militia. Missouri was one of those states that was kind of leaning both ways during the conflict, and they wanted to prevent the Union soldiers from coming in and suppressing, and of course the first thing they took, did was take the barracks in St. Louis. Clemens served for two weeks, retreating the entire time. Uh, he wrote a book on retreating, and he said he knew all the maneuvers. <laughs> One direction. Uh, and that's interesting because Grant, on the other hand, only knew one direction. He never walked backwards. He always went forward. So sometimes he was lost. He only went forward to get wherever he was going. So that was a little difference between the two men. They were very good friends. We're going to talk about him a little bit. Sam first published Philadelphia's Saturday Evening Post in 1851 at the age of 15. Mark unsuccessfully mined for silver and gold in Nevada and California. In the media sensation, Twain's Junkie Drug Story was first published in November 18, 1865. At 17, he found a $50 bill. It was blowing around and it landed right on his chest. He had to put a little ad in the newspaper. For three days it had to be there and appear. $50 bill found. Possible owner, please stop at such and such at the newspaper and you can claim it. For three days he sweated that out. He said he buried it as far as he could down on the third base. <laughs> and nobody claimed it. So he used that money to go east and left Hannibal. Age 17. His mother made him swear not to swear or drink or gamble. I thought that was interesting. Swear not to swear. Mark Twain was friends with Frederick Douglass, General U.S. Grant, President Theodore Roosevelt, Nikola Tesla, Andrew Carnegie, Helen Keller, Roger Kipling, Winston Churchill, President Woodrow Wilson, Harriet Beecher Stowe, P.T. Barnum. Believe me, it's just a small list. 18 December 31st, 1867, his first date with his future wife, Libby. They were married February 2nd, 1870, to see Charles Dickens on their first date, Reed, in New York City. That should be a capital C if anybody's correcting spelling. Any teachers? Did y'all catch that? I caught it after I printed it. In 1885, Mark publishes U.S. Grant's memoirs and dates. Mrs. Grant, we already said that in the other test. He printed 300,000 two-volume sets of Grant's memoirs. Amazing. And of course, personal recollections of John R. His last novel published in 1896 in his lifetime. And there are 
expanded answers on the back. If you want and have questions later, I'd be happy to answer those. So we have all of these remarkable cases now. How many people do you think it's possible for Mark Twain to influence? Pretty much everyone. That's a, that's a true statement. When I was going through putting this list together for this particular program, I also came up with another short list. And I'm just going to read a few names because I had people that you would recognize. I'm pretty sure. Social friends, different from close friends. Uh, Helen Keller, Frederick Douglass, Joel Chandler Harris, we talked about him this morning. Charles Dudley Warner, William Dean Hulls, Harriet Beecher Stowe, political friends, John Hay. And if you look on the other sheet, by the way, not all of those people that I read are on this sheet. But John Hay is kind of an interesting guy. How many of you know who he is? That's right. Secretary of President Lincoln, Ambassador to Great Britain, Secretary of State to President McKinley, helped conclude the Spanish-American War. He formulated the America's open door policy with China, and he secured American control of the Panama Canal Zone. Well, that's just to mention a few things. The second week, you should see what he did. Uh, Winston Churchill, of course, we mentioned. He was not a close friend of Winston's, but he was at a dinner in London, and they were honoring somebody else, and Clemens and Churchill both liked to smoke cigars, and they got up from the dinner, and they went on the balcony, and somebody told them that Winston liked to talk and smoke, and they were out there for about half an hour, and Clemens came in by himself, and somebody said, so how was your conversation with Winston? He said, I had a great smoke. <laughs> Booker T. Washington, Maxim Gorky. How many of you know who that is? Gorky Park, yeah. Is that music? What's that? It's not like a music artist. It's a one. Wow, I like that music. Can you play more? <laughs> we had one of the first telephones in Hartford, Connecticut. You know, and I like things with new inventions, and I had a lot of friends who were scientists, and that fellow came to my house one day and he asked me, he said, I could buy a stock and get in at the ground floor, and I told him, thank you very much, but I done that many times only to find out later there were people that got in at the basement level. <laughs> but his name was Alex something or another. I wished him well. Yeah, that was it. Did he come to your house too? <laughs> I turned him away. Well, that's the right thing. Yeah, I just sent out a Christmas card to all my friends and I said, and we should have world peace, and we should do this, and we should do that, and bring all the poor food. We used, my wife and I used to do that in our carriage and sled in the snow, and we would take food to the people who were poor. Because I said maybe someday that would be me that would be the recipient of that food, and I would need to alter things. So it's a good idea to do it in advance, and people will remember who you are. But anyway, I said, and wish everyone a happy uh, New Year and a Merry Christmas, except for the inventor of that telephone. <laughs> we had one of the first telephones in Hartford, Connecticut, is what I started to say, and one day they shut off my gas, and I couldn't call the gas company because they didn't have a phone. That's true as well. How many of you think that's true? I should be asking you. How many of you think it's not? How many aren't sure? <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I think if you do care, you should go home and check for yourself and make sure that I say what I mean and I mean what I say. Did Clemens have a phone in his house in Hartford? He certainly did. One of the first in Connecticut. Hartford, Connecticut. Yeah, been in the house. Next door to Harriet. If they needed to use the phone, they came to our house. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I tried to get a pair of socks out of my drawer up in the house and they wouldn't let me in. <laughs> we 
the first time that Max and Borky we were talking about him. He came to the United States and he was promoting the revolution over in Russia. I was all in favor of that. Every revolution I was in favor of. I was in favor of the Spanish-American conflict in Cuba, that we were going to free the Cubans. Theodore Roosevelt went in there and did that pretty quickly. And then what did we do? We decided we were going to buy all this property from Spain, and now we are going to be imperialists and use it for our own benefit. We weren't there to free those people. We were there to subjugate them. So Gorky came over, and I was in favor of what they were doing in Russia against the monarchy that was there. And he brought over his mistress, not his wife. And I said I couldn't tolerate that. It was a, a moral conflict. So I said, you can continue to visit, and I'll be happy to give you some names, but I'm not going to promote what you personally are doing. He's very outspoken about that. Joseph Roswell Hawley, he was in charge of the Hartford Evening Press and the editor. Uh, he was the first governor in Connecticut that I knew. And he was a representative for five years and then a senator for 24 years. Wealthy friends now. Henry Huddleston Rogers, he was the president of Standard Oil, uh, one of its original founders. Vice President. He was a close friend. He was, well, look on your sheet. See what it says about him. It's about midway down, I think. I want somebody to read it for me because I can't find it. It's one of the most powerful and ruthless industrialists in America. Thank you very much. Did everybody hear that? Mm -hmm. One of the most powerful and ruthless industrialists in America. Why would he be a personal friend to you? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. No guesses? Anybody know the history? Because you like money. I did like money. Yeah, but there was another reason. Uh, I think that maybe Dick Carnegie had more money than. And, you know, I was kind of finicky about the money. I liked it, but. Uh, I got into financial trouble with my inventions that I was invested in. I had a page compositor, and I wish I could uh, put my finger on it quickly. That's too quick. This book's hardly ever been used. I think I could sell it on the... Would that be a fine condition or rather well used and torn? Evidence well loved. Considering the age, probably accept. I was thinking that about myself. <laughs> <laughs> it may be acceptable. Oh, here it is. Isn't this a piece of work? Look at this. That's the Page Compositor. His name is James Page. And it's spelled different. It's P-A-I-G-E. -E. But... Uh, I invested over $275,000 in that invention, and it really didn't work very well. It had about 40,000 movable parts. It was basically like a typewriter for setting print, and I said that I was going to have those in every major city, and they revolutionized the printing industry, and I'd be able to buy New York City with all the proceeds. But it didn't work out. I had to pay off my debts, and I actually went on a world tour that was uh, presented in 1895. I was going to use my lectures, and here I am talking as Clemens. I forget who I am when I'm talking, but that's what Clemens was saying. He gave over a thousand lectures, and he received more money from his lectures uh, than anybody that was on the circuit. So that's how he paid off a five-year plan in basically 19 months. But was, friends with Standard Oil, how come? That, well, that was uh, Rogers, Henry Rogers. He was the fellow that helped collect all the money and pay off my creditors. We sent the money to him. He took care of it. He put together my publishing. He said, you're going to stay on top of this. Uh, we will be able to uh, 
negotiate new contracts. I'll be able to continue printing and publishing. And consequently, I was guaranteed $25,000 a year at 1900 So that was an excellent person to have in charge of, if you will, my finances and my records. So he was a good person. He had a nice, he had one of the fastest boats. So I liked associating with him, but he also helped to pay for people that I recommended, Helen Keller, pay for her college education. So I like to think I did the same thing with Andrew Carnegie. You know, when he sold his steel company in 1901, he sold it for $401 million. He immediately started a foundation with $325 million, and he ran the foundation for 18 years until he died. He also put together a program called a Simplified Spelling. You know, in this country, we think the spelling is challenging. In 1900, it was even worse. And he put together that foundation and the Simplified Spelling. And there were 30 people on the board of that. And of course, I'll never find that. But anyway, the people on the board, a lot of them we know, and they would be presidents of universities. They would be uh, governors. So the point was that we had all of these people connected in our degrees. They were money. They were powerful. They were capable of putting money behind ideas that I might have had. I didn't have that kind of money. Scientist Nikola Tesla, Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin I met in London, and he had a Tom Sawyer book on his desk, his night bed, you know, nightstand, and he would read it that night, the stories. Mm -hmm. I said, that explains a lot to me about some of his theories. <laughs> Senator William Nye, Senator William Stewart, Carl Schurz, Francis Gillette. He had a son, and he was an actor, and he portrayed, bless you, uh, Sherlock Holmes. He was the first person to portray Senator Gillette's son, and I helped finance and pay for his training in art, uh, acting. Governors, my brother was the acting governor in the territory of Nevada. I saw I knew a lot of governors, but my brother was actually one. Um, that's amazing. That was one of maybe Abraham's only mistakes. <laughs> Here I am back as Clemens, forgetting. Authors and poets that he knew, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Roger Kipling. Yeah, he was amazed with Kipling. They became very good friends, of course, we know what Kipling wrote, uh, his ballad, East is East and West is West, and there the twain shall meet. It was about the relationship between he and Clemens. And of course, they were very radical in their writings to the governments and the world at large, and atrocities against other humans. Bram Stoker wrote Dracula, Sir James Barry, Peter Pan, George Bernard Shaw, uh, 1984, of course. Joe Goodman, newspapers, magazines, Dan DeQuill, the same. Here's William Gillette. James Whistler, he was in Whistler's studio, and he was touching, Clemens was touching the painting, and Whistler said, don't touch that, it's still wet. Clemens said, it's okay, I'm wearing gloves. <laughs> <laughs> The preachers that he knew, Henry Ward Beecher, Thomas Beecher, and I spelled it wrong here, it's two E's, not one, it's Beecher, Ch uh, Joe Twitchell. So, Clemens was an acknowledged agnostic. So, he argued about religion all the time. He wasn't sure, but all of his friends were trying to keep him on track, and so he knew about religion. He had 13 Bibles in his house. He had an illustrated Bible so that his daughters could understand what the stories were about. Um, 
but he had a lot of arguments with God. How many of you have ever done that after a calamity or a catastrophe in your life that exists? It happens to all of us. And we're not happy about the things. I heard um, somebody mention anger. And that's what comes up. And he was angry with a lot of things that God did. I don't think I can read to you this next page. There's too many names. Books that he published in his own firm included Leo Tolstoy, uh, Pope Leo XIII, Walt Whitman, eight or ten of the generals during the Civil War, Stedman, William's daughter, Dahlgren, Daniel Beard. Now he, he published the writings of Christopher Columbus. Now Columbus didn't submit them, but somebody else did. They gathered them and they were published. Henry George, five books, Arthur Waugh, uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson was the book that was published. David Kalakawa, that was the king of Hawaii, and it was the legends and myths of Hawaii, the fables and folk folklore of the strange place. His favorite authors were Cervantes, Swift, Stevenson, Charles Dickens, Daniel Defoe, Lewis Carroll, and of course he parodied Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes, William Shakespeare, Jules Byrne, just to mention a couple. This book is a reference book. There's another part, another book, and this is by Kent Rasmussen, Everything You Want to Know About Mark Twain, and Six Easy Lessons, including the chronological order, has a really nice I don't use this book very much. I had the privilege of meeting him at a conference, and uh, I came up behind him. He looks like Baby Huey. He's a great big guy. Tapped him on the back of the shoulder. By the shoulder. I said, you don't know who I am, but I use your book all the time. I tell people about the things that we're doing in conferences, schools. You probably influence 20 or 30,000 people. When the police let me go. <laughs> this is, if you're teaching Huck Finn, this is the book you want to read. The Jim Dilemma. Jim Dilemma. Reading Race and Huckleberry Finn. They now publish Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer without the N word. I don't know if you knew that or not. It's a good book. I own them both. Do they say black? They use a different word. However they use it. I don't remember if they said black or something else, but they do not use the N-word. And I contend, yeah. uh, when Huckleberry Finn was first published at the Melissa Public Library in Massachusetts, uh, that <clears throat> they forbid the book to be on the shelves because of the uh, uh, language that was used, not that, but the colloquial. You know, this is the first time we deviated from the King's English. So that was verboten. And uh, later, of course, Hemingway says if it had not been for Mark Twain, we'd still be writing that way. So he thinks that Mark Twain was the father of American literature. This is one of my uh, new favorite books. This is a uh, chronology of uh, Mark Twain's interviews when he was out on the lecture tour. And he actually wrote a piece and he said, here are the most frequently asked questions. I've answered them. We're going to sit and have a few cocktails, socialize. When you go back to the paper, I hope you write something nicer about me than I could have told you. Oh. <laughs> uh, this book, a historical guide to Mark Twain. It has different subjects, religion, uh, sex, and everything that you might want to read that you would want to know about, and it talks about the different categories. Joan of Arc, of course, we talked about yesterday. 25 chapters from his autobiography that were published at the turn of the century in 1906. And those are from the three-volume set that just recently came out that he wanted not to be published until he was dead for 100 years because he was telling the truth about his friends, notable people, that it would reflect negatively on his family, and he didn't want to, uh, that to happen. So that was what happened there. And then, let's see what other books do we have here. 
Somebody was talking about the quotes the other day, and that they were all, there were a whole, this is called Mark Twain's notebook. He kept journals every year for probably 50 plus years, a little bit more than that. Somebody was going to go to Europe and was going to journal for two weeks, and he said, I wish you well, and good luck on that. And then he privately wrote, tried doing it for 10 years or 20 or 30. How many of you journal? One person? I've tried it a thousand times, but not done very well. This, I really like this book, uh, Mark Twain's Social Critic by Philip Foner. And again, it's one of those category books about politics and government and religion, capital, brotherhood of man. Wow, the Brotherhood of Man, isn't that something that he would have been writing about that? They did not know in the world at large that Huckleberry Finn was about race. And that Jim was Huck's mentor. A lot of people didn't realize that. And there's a great story about that, and it kind of goes back to this book. Isn't this a beauty? This is, this is Tom Sawyer. That was gifted to me. They made it into a birdhouse. It's the first printing of this, but it was a second print of the first printing. Uh, so it's worth a lot of money. If it was the book and it was the first printing, it'd be worth about $15,000. Maybe less. I brought it home, I showed it to my wife and son. I said, what do you think of this? And they said, I'm sure you would rather have had the book. I said, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> but it's nice to know that my books have gone to the birds. <laughs> so, when, so when I published that book, it was written for men, for adults, to remember their childhood. And my wife and a good friend of mine said, we recommend that you go back and you write it for children. So I had to go back and butcher everything I had written because it was ready for Christmas sales and I had to go back and rewrite it so it reads very choppy and we read this in schools today it's very difficult to read it doesn't flow it's not smooth but something else happened I immediately wrote 16 chapters for Huck Finn and I was going to crank that out right away you know, I've got writer's block and I didn't know what to do. Again, I'm talking like on this forehand. <laughs> That'll happen a lot. I'm starting to forget what my identity is. <laughs> but he didn't know how to proceed after he got down to Cairo, whether he would go downriver or go up the Ohio River. So he actually uh, let it sit. Mm -hmm. And later he got involved with Grant, and as a result of working with Grant, he now was aware of how to proceed with this book. And he wrote the last part of the book in short order, and he published it, uh, most of it in 1885, but there were some editions that came out in 1884. So he wrote a very critical story that could not be told from a man's perspective, but from a boy's perspective, it was acceptable. And that's why he was able to publish that book. Otherwise, it would have never been allowed uh, to be print. This is, uh, of course... Hey, Warren, there's a, there was a question. Yes? Just a comment. I'm reading Tom Sawyer with my 11-year-old grandson. Mm, he stopped immediately. Oh. <laughs> jump, right, jump right over into Tom Sawyer uh, abroad. <laughs> He likes to, he, and my husband found that one recently. Just recently found that at a, a Goodwill store. No, yeah, it, store. if you're reading it, that makes a different connection, so it's different. Because they're not reading it, so you're telling it to them, and they can absorb that better than they could be reading it. He's, he's you follow what I mean by yeah, that, right? Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. My grandson does like the story of... of it's a great story. Because, oh, and he says it's stories. It is. He's Tom Sawyer is a wild, fictitious inventor of nonsense. He just says, Grandma, it's a, just a bunch of short stories. Yeah, and you know what Huck Finn says about, he was all set to learn about Moses and the bull rushers until he found out Moses was dead. 
Mm -hmm. You don't put no stock in no dead people. Right? <laughs> Smart child. Yeah. Yeah. I was that way when I was first reading history. You know what? Why, why, why is this important? You know what I mean. How many of you know what I mean? How many of you like history even from the beginning? Mm -hmm. you know, I like listening to the battles and all that stuff, but that was about it. Yeah, so this book, Clemens and Warner were sitting at the kitchen table with the wives and they were complaining about Jane Austen making a lot of money. <laughs> and the wife said, if you think you could do better, write a book. And they did. And in just a few months, they sat down, they each wrote about half of the book. Warner wrote all the romance, Clemens wrote all the politics because he had been an assistant to the senator, Stewart, from the Nevada Territory in D.C. And he had covered from the newspaper perspective as a reporter in D.C. as well. So he knew a lot about, and I like what he talks about, and I know you won't. He said, if you're getting an appropriation put through, you need 10000 for a male lobbyist, 3000 oh, for a senior lobbyist, 3000 for a male, female was 3000 for a lobbyist, High moral senator, 3,000. Chairman of the committee, 10,000. And then, you know, that's how you got things through with appropriations. Something motherly, uh, something good and motherly about Washington, the grand old benevolent national asylum for the helpless. <laughs> what book is that you're holding up? This is The Gilded Age. Oh, Some of you may have heard of it. Uh, thank you. Uh, pardon? The authors are Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner. Yeah, that's another close friend of mine. You know, I didn't mention two of the really close friends. Actually, you know, my wife, my wife's family. Um, what can you say about people that are taking good care of you, other than thank you. Really, that, that's about the extent of how you can do that. This is uh, Mark Twain speaking, and uh, has all of his speeches listed. Some of them actually have the actual speeches, and some of them just say where they were and when they happened. This is a great book. The fellow that edited this book, oh, I didn't mention this one. This really was one of my favorite autobiographies. I kept seeing posts by this guy. His name is Henderson. Archibald Henderson. Anybody hear by that name? It's a very distinguished name. I love it. He talks about things. Philosopher, moralist, socialist. He rode with him on the trip over to Oxford in 1907. He was the son of a senator from North Carolina. He was a mathematician. And when you ride with somebody for 10 days, like Clemens, who actually likes to talk, you learn a lot about the man. And he started writing about him, and he put this autobiography together, and it's got some really nice pictures in here. He thought this section was the philosopher, moralist, and socialist. Highly recommended. This one is the book talks about all of Clemens' involvement with the anti-imperialist program. During 1900 to 1920, roughly, <clears throat> there was a significant part of our population here in the United States that was not in favor of imperialism. So Clemens was actually a regional vice president of this organization from 1900 to 1910 until he died. The fellow and the articles that are in here were written by Clemens, but they were suppressed by the United States government. And the fellow that edited this, Jim Zwick, is responsible for getting me involved in doing this program. So, you know, there are a lot of things that I wanted to mention. He was against all of the abuse with the Chinese <clears throat> that took place in the United States. He wrote a lot of negative things about the Indians, but he said, when you get to heaven, there are two Paiute Indians that will greet you at the gate. They won't let you in if you haven't behaved on earth. So he was a worldwide supporter of human rights and human liberties. 
was the most famous American of his day, father of American literature. By laughing at ourselves using humor and the hopes we can improve the human condition, we want to encourage literacy, peace, and brotherhood. Storytelling is the key to education. Here's a list of the members of the spelling. Good article. And this is a small list of the people that were part of the anti imperialist program. So we'll take some questions from the audience. Am I remembering correctly that uh, you wrote a, a translation of the Bible? Of the Bible. We have a, a former Nebraska State Senator um, that is now retired that always referred to the Bible. It's a Bible. Yeah. Well, I can appreciate that. I did, in Missouri, you know, they don't know how to say Missouri. They say, half of them say Missouri. And half of them say Missouri. <clears throat> they can't even agree on that. But Seems am I like, correct that you wrote? I wrote several things that were, I'll call them stories of uh, Captain Stormfield's Visit to Heaven. It's one of my favorite books. Okay. And that's the story about a man when he dies, he rides on a meteorite, he's going down to blazes to the inferno to spend the eternity. And he collides with another meteorite that's like a giant hotel with tens of thousands of people going to heaven. And they collide in midstream, and one goes down and the other one goes up. They go the wrong places. So he writes derivations of the stories that we would be presenting. He wrote Adam's Diary and Eve's Diary. That's what I said. <clears throat> they were separate books. He dedicated Eve's Diary to his wife, Libby, after she died. And that would have been June 6th, uh, June 5th of 1904. And in that story, of course, they live outside of the garden because of the fall. And on her tombstone, it says, <clears throat> it is better to have lived outside of the garden with her than to have lived on the inside of the garden without her. Uh, uh, nice. Lovely. Sweet. Great question. Well, just a comment in what you said last night about encouraging all of us to get involved and run for public office. And I just, I just want to echo that again and just say how much I appreciate your work Thank and you. Nebraska Humanities. I mean, we all know there are efforts to ban Mark Twain books sure. from our libraries and our schools. So just to say kudos and thank you, and I hope all of us keep raising our voices in thank our you. school board meetings and our libraries. They want to get rid of this. We didn't plan too. this, but... Yeah. <laughs> Mark Twain for president. That's my picture on there. He wrote a story, Mark Twain for president. He also wrote one. Yeah, and I like that story. And it's kind of about 15 minutes to tell. But it's a good story. It's two pages to read. Any last questions? Yes? You mentioned that Mark Twain didn't really believe in God. He was an agnostic. So, so tell us more about that. Why? Well, because, because he couldn't produce proof, and, you know, and he was pretty tied to that. He did not like organized religion at all, and the reason was everybody is a hypocrite. Not everybody, but significant part of the population. Show of hands, how many of you here are hypocrites? Do as I say, not as I do. And he abhorred that. And, you know, it's taken me a long time to come to grips with that. Uh, I'm a practicing Baptist at the moment, but I used to be involved in other sets of the religion. But yeah. all that I had to say is, I asked for forgiveness and it's done. <laughs> wow, that's pretty great. You know, and I'm okay with that. And I believe that I, the hardest thing I have to do in life is pray for people that I don't like. Yeah. Or that yeah. do something that are terrible. Yeah. But that's what I'm asked to do. Yeah. And I read something interesting recently, and I was sharing it this morning. Uh, a fellow by the name of Max Lucado yeah. has a little booklet that came out and said, you know, there was this guy and he knew 13 people and they were able to create what we see today. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Only takes 13 people. Yeah. No. Doesn't take an entire yeah. hundreds of millions. 
Just 13 people can create great things. Uh, what would be the first book you would recommend for a child? That's an excellent computer? question. What's the first book I would recommend for a child? <clears throat> I would recommend for young children some of his speeches. That There's a book, two couple books on his speeches. Project Gutenberg has on the internet every one of his written works published before 1923 available to read, to get in the uh, audible books. And they have all, all the books have all the original illustrations. And so those are very powerful for young children. Uh, I've told stories to people as young as four years of age that enjoy the stories that I would tell. So it's the cadence of the rhythm of the story and some of the wild, crazy ideas of Tom Sawyer and the like. So for young boys that are eight or nine, I recommend The Prince and the Pauper. And for young women, uh, eighth grade, I recommend Joan of Arc. This is one of the most powerful books uh, for a young woman to see what's possible and what they could do. Wow. Good question. Thank you. All set? <laughs> Want to mention some things for tonight? You've got that covered, Keith? Thank you. Thank you very much.